Hi, I'm Buck, your personal tour guide to the Federal Reserve. I'm here to introduce you to one of the most complex but effective institutions in the United States. But don't worry, I'll explain it all in plain English. Just beside me is a road map of where we're going. Together, we'll walk through the Federal Reserve System, literally. And along the way, I'll show you just what goes on around here and why it's important. By the end of this tour, you too will be able to explain the Federal Reserve in plain English. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. That would effectively be a takeover of monetary policy by the Congress, a, re a repudiation of the independence of the Federal Reserve, which would be highly destructive to the stability of the financial system, the dollar, and uh, our national economic situation. Uh, we don't, the Federal Reserve does not own any gold at all. We have not owned gold since 1934. All our lives, we've been told that economics is boring. It's dull. It's not worth the time it takes to understand it. And all our lives, we've been lied to. War, poverty, revolution. They all hinge on economics. And economics all rests on one key concept. Money. Money. It is the economic water in which we live our lives. We even call it currency. It flows around us, carries us in its wake, drowns those who are not careful. We use it every day, in nearly every transaction we conduct. We spend our lives working for it, worrying about it, saving it, spending it, pinching it. It defines our social status. It compromises our morals. People are willing to fight, die, and kill for it. But what is it? Where does it come from? How is it created? Who controls it? It is a remarkable fact that, given its central importance in our lives, not one person in a hundred could answer such basic questions about money as these. So if you were planning a family, you'd want to know where babies come from. And this is a lot about banking. So let me ask you, where does money come from? Where does the money come from? Where does any the money... The government prints it. It's printed off. Where does money come from? How is new money created? By labor. People work and, and produce wealth and that... And the money is supposed to match that wealth. Where does money come from? Well, I have a pretty different outlook on money. It actually comes from, like, trees, right? But why is this? How could we be so ignorant about a topic of such importance? Where does money come from is a basic, childlike question. So why is our only response the childlike answer meant as a joke? It grows on trees. Such a profound state of ignorance could not come about naturally. From the time we are children, we are curious about the world and eager to learn about the way it works. And what could lead to a better understanding of the way the world works than a knowledge of money, its creation and destruction? Yet discussion of this topic is fastidiously avoided in our school years and ignored in our daily life. Our monetary ignorance is artificial, a smoke screen that has been erected on purpose and perpetrated with the help of complicated systems and insufferable economic jargon. But it doesn't take an economist to understand the importance of money. Deep down we all know that the wars, the poverty, the violence we see around us hinges on this question of money. It seems like a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle just waiting to be solved. And it is. The puzzle pieces, taken together, 
create an image of the Federal Reserve, America's central bank, and the heart of the country's banking system. Despite its central importance to the economy, relatively few have heard of it, and fewer still know what it is, despite the bank's attempts at self-description. Our economy runs on a complex system of exchange of goods and services, in which money plays a key part. Coin, currency, savings, and checking accounts, the overall supply of money is managed by the Federal Reserve. Money is the medium through which economic exchanges take place, and money as a standard of value helps us to set prices for goods and services. The job of managing money, monetary policy, is to preserve the purchasing power of the dollar while ensuring that a sufficient amount of money is available to promote economic growth. The Federal Reserve also promotes the safety and soundness of the institutions where we do our banking. It ensures that the mechanisms by which we make payments, whether by cash, check, or electronic means, operate smoothly and efficiently. And in its fiscal role, acts as the banker for the United States government. Now, these duties comprise the major responsibilities of our central bank. But in order to really understand the Federal Reserve, we must first understand its origins and context. We must deconstruct the puzzle. The first piece of that puzzle lies here, in the White House. This is where the Federal Reserve Act, then known as the Currency Bill, was signed into law after passing the House and Senate in late December 1913. The New York Times of Christmas Eve 1913 described the festive scene. The Christmas spirit pervaded the gathering. While the ceremony was a little less impressive than that of the signing of the Tariff Act on October 3rd last in the same room, the spectators were much more enthusiastic and seized every occasion to applaud. There in the White House that fateful December evening, President Wilson signed away the last veneer of control over the American money supply to a cartel, a well-organized gang of crooks so successful, so cunning, so well-hidden, that even now, a century later, few know of its existence, let alone the details of its operations. But those details have been openly admitted for decades. Of course, just as we have been taught to find economics boring, we have been taught that this story is boring. This is the way the Federal Reserve itself tells it. The United States was facing severe financial problems. At the turn of the century, most banks were issuing their own currency, called banknotes. The trouble was, currency that was good in one state was sometimes worthless in another. People began to lose confidence in their money, since it was only as sound as the bank that issued it. Fearful that their bank might go out of business, they rushed to exchange their banknotes for gold or silver. By attempting to do so, they created the Panic of 1907. During the panic, people streamed to the banks and demanded their deposits. The banks could not meet the demand. They simply did not have enough gold and silver coin available. Many banks went under. People lost millions of dollars. Businesses suffered. Unemployment rose. And the stability of our economic system was again threatened. Well, this couldn't go on. If the country was going to grow and prosper, some means would have to be found to achieve financial and economic stability. To prevent financial panics, like the one in 1907, President Woodrow Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act into law in 1913. But this is history as told by the victors, a revisionist vision in which the creation of a central bank to control the nation's money supply is merely a boring historical footnote about as important as the invention of the zipper or an early 20th century hula hoop craze. The truth is that the story of the secret banking conclave that gave birth to that Federal Reserve Act is as exciting and dramatic as any Hollywood screenplay or detective novel yarn, and all the more remarkable for the fact that it is all true. We pick up the story, appropriately enough, under cover of darkness. It was the night of November 22, 1910, and a group of the richest and most powerful men in America were boarding a private rail car at an unassuming railroad station in Hoboken, New Jersey. The car, waiting with shades drawn to keep onlookers from seeing inside, belonged to Senator Nelson Aldrich, the father-in-law of billionaire heir to the Rockefeller dynasty, John D. Rockefeller Jr., 
A central figure on the influential Senate Finance Committee where he oversaw the nation's monetary policy, Aldrich was referred to in the press as the general manager of the nation. Joining him that evening was his private secretary, Shelton, and a who's who of the nation's banking and financial elite. A. Pyatt Andrew, the assistant treasury secretary, Frank Vanderlip, president of the National City Bank of New York, Henry P. Davison, a senior partner of J.P. Morgan Company, Benjamin Strong Jr., an associate of J.P. Morgan and president of Bankers Trust Co., and Paul Warburg, heir of the Warburg banking family and son-in-law of Solomon Loeb of the famed New York investment firm Kuhn Loeb & Company. The men had been told to arrive one by one after sunset to attract as little attention as possible. Indeed, secrecy was so important to their mission that the group did not use anything but their first names throughout the journey so as to keep their true identity secret even from their own servants and waitstaff. The movements of any one of them would have been reason enough to attract the attention of New York's voracious press, especially in an era where banking and monetary reform was seen as a key issue for the future of the nation. A meeting of all of them, now that would surely have been the story of the century. And it was. Their destination? The secluded Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia, home to the prestigious Jekyll Island Club whose members included the Morgans, Rockefellers, Warburgs, and Rothschilds. Their purpose? Davison told intrepid local reporters who had caught wind of the meeting that they were going duck hunting. But in reality, they were going to draft a reform of the nation's banking industry in complete secrecy. G. Edward Griffin, the author of the best-selling The Creature from Jekyll Island and a longtime Federal Reserve researcher, explains. What happened is that the banks decided that since there was going to be legislation anyway to control their industry, that they wouldn't just sit back and wait and see what happened and cross their fingers that it would be okay. They decided that to do what so many cartels do today, they decided to take the lead and they would be the ones calling for regulations and reform. They like the word reform and um, the American people are suckers for the word reform. You just put that into any corrupt piece of legislation, call it reform and people say, oh, I'm, I'm all for reform and so they vote for it or accept it. So that's what they were doing. They decided we will reform our own industry. In other words, we will uh, create a cartel and we will give the cartel the power of government. We'll take our cartel agreement so that we can self-regulate to our advantage and we'll call it the Federal Reserve Act. And then we'll take this this uh, cartel agreement to Washington and uh, convince those idiots there to pass it into law. And that basically was the strategy. It was brilliant strategy. Of course, we see it happening all the time and certainly in our own day today we see the same thing happening in other cartelized industry right now we're watching it unfold in the field of healthcare but at that time it was banking all right and so the the banking cartel wrote their own rules and regulations called it the federal reserve act got it passed into law and it was very much to their liking because they wrote it and in in essence what they had created is a set of rules which made it possible for themselves to regulate their industry, but they went even beyond that. In fact, it's clear to me when I was reading their letters and uh, their conversations uh, at the time and the debates uh, that they never dreamed that Congress would go along and also give them the right to issue the nation's money supply. I mean, not only were they now going to regulate their own industry, which is what they started out as wanting to do, but they got this, this uh, incredible gift that they didn't dream would be given to them, although they were negotiating for it. And that was Congress gave them the authority to issue the nation's money. And Congress gave away the, the sovereign right to issue the nation's money to the private banks. And so all of this was in the Federal Reserve Act. And the American people were joyous because they were told and they were convinced that this was finally a means of controlling this big creature from Jekyll Island. Amazingly enough, they were successful, not just in conspiring to write the legislation that would eventually become the Federal Reserve Act, but in keeping that conspiracy a secret from the public for decades. It was first reported on in 1916 by Bertie Charles Forbes, the financial writer who would later go on to found Forbes magazine, 
but it was never fully admitted until a quarter century later when Frank Vanderlip wrote a casual admission of the meeting in the February 9, 1935 edition of the Saturday Evening Post. I was as secretive, indeed as furtive, as any conspirator. I do not feel it is any exaggeration to speak of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. Over the course of their nine days of deliberation at the Jekyll Island Club, they devised a plan so overarching, so ambitious, that even they could scarcely imagine that it would ever be passed by Congress. As Vanderlip put it, Discovery of our plan, we knew, simply must not happen, or else all our time and effort would be wasted. If it were to be exposed publicly that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress. So what precisely did this conclave of conspirators devise at their Jekyll Island meeting? A plan for a central banking system to be owned by the banks themselves. A system which would organize the nation's banks into a private cartel that would have sole control over the money supply itself. At the end of their nine-day meeting, the bankers and financiers went back to their respective offices content in what they had accomplished. The details of the plan changed between its 1910 drafting and the eventual passage of the Federal Reserve Act, but the essential ideas were there. But ultimately, this scene on Jekyll Island, too, is just one piece of a larger puzzle. And like any other puzzle piece, it has to be seen in its wider context for the bigger picture to become visible. To understand the other pieces of the puzzle and their importance in the creation of the Federal Reserve, we have to travel backward in time. The story begins in late 17th century Europe. The Nine Years' War is raging across the continent as Louis XIV of France finds himself pitted against much of the rest of the continent over his territorial and dynastic claims. King William III of England, devastated by a stunning naval defeat, commits his court to rebuilding the English Navy. There's only one problem. Money. The government's coffers have been exhausted by the waging of the war, and William's credit is drying up. A Scottish banker, William Patterson, has a banker's solution. A proposal to form a company to lend a million pounds to the government at 6% plus 5,000 management fee with the right of note issue. By 1694, the idea has been slightly revised, a 1.2 million pound loan at 8% plus 4,000 for management expenses, but it goes ahead. The magnanimously titled Bank of England is created. The name is a carefully constructed lie, designed to make the bank appear to be a government entity, but it is not. It is a private bank owned by private shareholders for their private profit with a charter from the king that allows them to print the public's money out of thin air and lend it to the crown. What happens here at the birth of the Bank of England in 1694 is the creation of a template that will be repeated in country after country around the world. A privately controlled central bank lending money to the government at interest. Money that it prints out of nothing and the jewel in the crown for the international bankers that creates this system is the future economic powerhouse of the world, the United States. In many important respects, the history of the United States is the history of the struggle of the American people against the banksters that wish to control their money. By the 1780s, with colonies still fighting for independence from the crown, the bankers will get their wish. In 1781, the United States is in financial turmoil. The Continental, the paper currency issued by the Continental Congress to pay for the war, has collapsed from overissue and British counterfeiting. Desperate to find a way to finance the end stages of the war, Congress turns to Robert Morris, a wealthy shipping merchant who was investigated for war profiteering just two years earlier. Now, as Superintendent of Finance of the United States from 1781 to 1784, he is regarded as the most powerful man in America, next to General Washington. In his capacity as superintendent of finance, Morris argues for the creation of a privately owned central bank deliberately modeled on the Bank of England that the colonies were supposedly fighting against. Congress, backed into a corner by war obligations and forced to do business with the bankers just like King William in the 1690s, acquiesces and charters the Bank of North America as the nation's first central bank. And exactly as the Bank of England came into existence loaning the British crown 1.2 million pounds, the BNA started business by loaning $1.2 million to Congress. By the end of the war, Morris has fallen out of political favor and the Bank of North America's currency has failed to win over a skeptical public. 
the BNA is downgraded from a national central bank to a private commercial bank chartered by the state of Pennsylvania. But the bankers have not given up yet. Before the ink is even dry on the Constitution, a group led by Alexander Hamilton is already working on the next privately owned central bank for the newly formed United States of America. So brazen is Hamilton in the forwarding of this agenda that he makes no attempt to hide his aims or those of the banking interests he serves. A national debt, if it is not excessive, will be to us a national blessing, he wrote in a letter to James Duane in 1781. It will be a powerful cement of our union. It will also create a necessity for keeping up taxation to a degree which, without being oppressive, will be a spur to industry. Opposition to Hamilton and his debt-based system for establishing the finances of the U.S. is fierce. Led by Jefferson and Madison, the bankers and their system of debt enslavement is called out for the force of destruction that it is, with Thomas Jefferson writing, The spirit of war and indictment, since the modern theory of the perpetuation of debt, has drenched the earth with blood and crushed its inhabitants under burdens ever accumulating. Still, Hamilton proves victorious. The first bank of the United States is chartered in 1791 and follows the pattern of the Bank of England and the Bank of North America almost exactly. A privately owned central bank with the authority to loan money that it creates out of nothing to the government. In fact, it is the very same people behind the new bank as were behind the old Bank of North America. It was Alexander Hamilton, Robert Morris's former aide, who first proposed Morris for the position of financial superintendent, and the director of the Old Bank of North America, Thomas Willing, is brought in to serve as the first director of the First Bank of the United States. Meet the new banking bosses, same as the old banking bosses. In the first five years of the bank's existence, the U.S. government borrows $8.2 million from the bank, and prices rise 72%. By 1795, when Hamilton leaves office, the incoming Treasury Secretary announces that the government needs even more money and sells off the government's meager 20% share in the bank, making it a fully private corporation. Once again, the U.S. economy is plundered while the private banking cartel laughs all the way to the bank that they created. By the time the bank's charter comes due for renewal in 1811, the tide has changed for the money interests behind the bank. Hamilton is dead, shot to death in a duel with Aaron Burr. The bank's supporting Federalist Party is out of power. The public are wary of foreign ownership of the central bank, and what's more, don't see the point of a central bank in time of peace. Accordingly, the charter renewal is voted down in the Senate, and the bank is closed in 1811. Less than a year later, the U.S. is once again at war with England. After two years of bitter struggle, the public debt of the U.S. has nearly tripled from $45.2 million to $119.2 million. With trade at a standstill, prices soaring, inflation rising, and debt mounting, President Madison signs the charter for the creation of another central bank, the Second Bank of the United States, in 1816. Just like the two central banks before it, it is majority privately owned and is granted the power to loan money that it creates out of thin air to the government. The 20-year bank charter is due to expire in 1836, but still in his first term, President Andrew Jackson has already vowed to let it die prior to renewal. Believing that Jackson won't risk his chance for re-election in 1832 on the issue, the bankers forward a bill to renew the bank's charter in July of that year, four years ahead of schedule. Remarkably, Jackson vetoes the renewal charter and stakes his re-election on the people's support of his move. In his veto message, Jackson writes in no uncertain terms about his opposition to the bank. Whatever interest or influence, whether public or private, has given birth to this act, it cannot be found either in the wishes or necessities of the executive department, by which present action is deemed premature, and the powers confirmed upon its agent not only unnecessary, but dangerous to the government and country. It is to be regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. If we cannot at once in justice to interests vested under improvident legislation, make our government what it ought to be, we can at least take a stand against all new grants of monopolies and exclusive privileges, against any prostitution of our government to the advancement of the few at the expense of the many, and in favor of compromise and gradual reform in our code of laws and system of political economy. The people side with Jackson, and he's re-elected on the back of his slogan, Jackson and no bank. The president makes good on his pledge, 
In 1833, he announces that the government will stop using the bank and will pay off its debt. The bankers retaliate in 1834 by staging a financial crisis and attempting to pin the blame on Jackson, but it's no use. On January 8, 1835, President Jackson succeeds in paying off the debt, and for the first and only time in its history, the United States is free from the debt chain of the bankers. In 1836, the second bank of the United States charter expires, and the bank loses its status as America's central bank. It is 77 years before the bankers can regain the jewel in their crown, but it is not for lack of trying. Immediately upon the death of the bank, the banking oligarchs in England react by contracting trade, removing capital from the US, demanding payment in hard currency for all exports, and tightening credit. This results in a financial crisis known as the Panic of 1837, and once again Jackson's campaign to kill the bank is blamed for the crisis. Throughout the late 19th century, the United States is rocked by banking panics brought about by wild banking speculation and sharp contractions in credit. By the dawn of the 20th century, the bulk of the money in the American economy has been centralized in the hands of a small clique of industrial magnates, each with a near monopoly on a sector of the economy. There are the Astors in real estate, the Carnegies and the Schwabs in steel, the Harrimans, Stanfords, and Vanderbilts in railroads, the Millens and the Rockefellers in oil. As all of these families start to consolidate their fortunes, they gravitate naturally to the banking sector. And in this capacity, they form a network of financial interests and institutions that centered largely around one man, banking scion and increasingly America's informal central banker in the absence of a central bank, John Pierpont Morgan. John Pierpont Morgan, or Pierpont as he prefers to be called, is born in Hartford, Connecticut in 1837 to Junius Spencer Morgan, a successful banker and financier. Morgan rides his father's coattails into the banking business, and by 1871 is partnered in his own firm, the firm that was eventually to become J.P. Morgan & Company. It is Morgan who finances Cornelius Vanderbilt's New York Central Railroad. It is Morgan that finances the launch of nearly every major corporation of the period, from AT&T to General Electric to General Motors to DuPont. It is Morgan who buys out Carnegie and creates the United States Steel Corporation, America's first billion-dollar company. It is Morgan who brokers a deal with President Grover Cleveland to save the nation's gold reserves by selling $62 million worth of gold to the Treasury in return for government bonds. And it is Morgan who, in 1907, sets in motion the crisis that leads to the creation of the Federal Reserve. That year, Morgan begins spreading rumors about the precarious finances of the Knickerbocker Trust Company, a Morgan competitor and one of the largest financial institutions in the United States at the time. The resulting crisis dubbed the Panic of 1907, shakes the U.S. financial system to its core. Morgan puts himself forward as a hero, boldly offering to help underwrite some of the faltering banks and brokerage houses to keep them from going under. After a bout of hand-wringing over the nation's finances, a congressional committee is assembled to investigate the Money Trust, the bankers and financiers who brought the nation so close to financial ruin and that wield such power over the nation's finances. The public follows the issue closely, and in the end, a handful of bankers are identified as key players in the Money Trust's operations, including Paul Warburg, Benjamin Strong Jr., and J.P. Morgan. Andrew Gavin Marshall, editor of the People's Book Project, explains. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was an investigation following the greatest of these financial panics, which was in 1907. And this investigation was on what was called the Money Trust, which found that uh, three banking interests, J.P. Morgan, National City Bank, and... Uh, the Citibank of New York, I believe it was, um, basically controlled the entire financial system. So three banks. And the public hatred towards these institutions was uh, unprecedented. Um, there, there was an overwhelming consensus in the country for establishing a central bank. But there were many different interests uh, in pushing this, and everyone had sort of their own uh, specific purpose behind advocating for a central bank. So to represent uh, the most people, you had uh, farmer interests, populists, progressives, who were advocating a central bank because they couldn't take the recurring panics, but they wanted government control of a central bank. They wanted it to be exclusively under the public control because they despised and feared uh, the New York banks as uh, wielding too much influence. So for them, a central bank would be a way to uh, curb the power uh, 
of um, these private financial interests. On the other hand, those same financial interests we're advocating for a central bank uh, to serve uh, as a, a source of stability for their um, control of the system, also to act as a lender of last resort to them, uh, and so that they would never have to face um, a collapse, but also um, in order to exert more control uh, through a central bank, the private New York banking community uh, wanted a central bank under the exclusive control of them. Uh, there's a shocker. So you had all these various different inter interests which converged. Uh, of course, the most influential happened to be the New York financial houses, which were uh, more aligned with European financial houses than they were with any other element in American society. Uh, the main individual behind the founding of the Federal Reserve was Paul Warburg, who was a partner with uh, Kuhn Loeb and Company, European banking house. His brothers um, were prominent bankers in Germany uh, at that time, and he had, of course, close connections with every um, major financial uh, and really big industrial firm in the United States and most of those existing in Europe. Uh, and he was discussing all these ideas with his uh, fellow compatriots um, in advocating for a central bank. In 1910, um, Warburg uh, with, uh, got the support of a senator named Senator Aldrich, uh, who later, uh, whose family later married into the Rockefeller family. Um, again, I'm sure just a coincidence, but... Um, uh, Aldrich invited Warburg and another, uh, a number of other bankers to a uh, private secret meeting on Jekyll Island, uh, just off the coast of Georgia, uh, where they met in 1910 uh, to discuss the construction of a central bank in the United States, but one which, of course, would be owned uh, and serve the interests of the private bankers. Aldrich then, in 1911, presented this as the Aldrich Plan or the Aldrich Bill in the U.S. Congress, uh, and it was actually voted out. The public, suspicious of Senator Aldrich's banking connections, ultimately reject the Jekyll Island Cabal's Aldrich Plan. The Cabal does not give up, however. They simply revise and rename their plan, giving it a new public face, that of Senator Robert Owen and Representative Carter Glass. In the end, the money trust that was behind the Panic of 1907 uses the public's own outrage against them to complete their consolidation of control over the banking system. The newly retitled Federal Reserve Act is signed into law on December 23, 1913, and the Fed begins operations the next year. So how does the Federal Reserve System work? What does it do? Who owns and controls it? These are the basic questions that would get to the heart of the fundamental question, what is money? And that is why the answer to these questions have been shrouded in impenetrable economic jargon. Even the Federal Reserve's own educational propaganda, which has an unusual tendency towards cutesy animation and talking down to its audience, has a difficult time summarizing the Fed's mission and responsibilities. According to the Fed, To achieve these goals, the Fed, then and now, combines centralized national authority through the Board of Governors, remember that on the map, with a healthy dose of regional independence through the reserve banks. A third entity, the Federal Open Market Committee, brings together the expertise of the first two in setting the nation's monetary policy. Precisely what imaginary gaggle of schoolchildren is this economic gibberish aimed at? The simple truth, hidden behind the sleight of hand of economic jargon and magisterial titles, is that a banking cartel has monopolized the most important item in our entire economy. Money itself. We are taught to think of money as the pieces of paper printed in government printing presses or coins minted by government mints. While this is partially true, in this day and age, the actual notes and coins circulating in the economy represent only a tiny fraction of the money in existence. Over 90% of the money supply is in fact created by private banks as loans that are payable back to the banks at interest. 
Although this simple fact is obscured by the wizards of Wall Street and gods of money who want to make the money creation process into some special art of alchemy carefully overseen by the government, the truth is not hidden from the public. In December 1977, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York published another of its dumbed-down cartoon-ridden information pamphlets for the general public attempting to explain the functions of the Federal Reserve System. There in black and white, they carefully explain the money creation process. Commercial banks create checkbook money whenever they grant a loan, simply by adding new deposit dollars to accounts on their books in exchange for a borrower's IOU. Banks create money by monetizing the private debts of businesses and individuals. That is, they create amounts of money against the value of those IOUs. There it is, in plain English. The vast majority of money in the economy, the checkbook money in our accounts at the bank, and that we use in our electronic transfers and digital payments, is created not by a government printing press, but by the bank itself. It is created out of thin air as debt, owed back to the bank that created it at interest. This means that bank loans are not money taken from other bank depositors, but new money simply conjured into existence and placed into your account. And the bank is able to create much more money than it has cash to back up those deposits. The Fed claims to be the entity overseeing and backing up the banking industry. It was established, according to its own propaganda, to stabilize the system and prevent bank runs like the Panic of 1907 from happening again. Throughout much of the 1800s, almost any organization that wanted could print its own money. As a result, many states, banks, and even one New York druggist did just that. In fact, at one time, there were over 30,000 different varieties of currency in circulation. Imagine the confusion. Not only were there multitudes of currencies, some were redeemable in gold and silver, Others were backed by bonds issued by regional governments. It was not unusual for people to lose faith both in the value of their currency and in the entire financial system. With many people trying to withdraw their deposits at once, sometimes the banks didn't have enough money on hand to pay their depositors. Then, when the funds ran out, the banks suspended payment temporarily and some even closed. People lost their entire savings and sometimes regional economies suffered. Obviously, something had to be done. And in 1913, something was. In that year, President Woodrow Wilson signed into effect the Federal Reserve Act. This act created the Federal Reserve System to provide a safer and more stable monetary and banking system. If that was indeed its aim, it signally failed to do so in running up one of the greatest bubbles in American history to that point in the 1920s, just a decade after its creation. The popping of that bubble, of course, led directly into the Great Depression and one of the greatest periods of mass poverty in American history. Economists have long argued that the Fed itself was the cause of the Depression by its complete mismanagement of the money supply. As former Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke admitted in a speech commemorating Fed critic Milton Friedman's 90th birthday, regarding the Great Depression, you're right, we did it. We're very sorry. But thanks to you, we won't do it again. Price stability is another cited tenet of the Federal Reserve's mandate. But here, too, the Fed has completely failed to live up to its own standards. Aside from the banking system, the Federal Reserve has another responsibility that's probably even more important. It's in charge of something called monetary policy. Basically, it means trying to keep prices stable to avoid inflation. Say you buy a CD today for $14, but what if next year the price of the CD jumped to $20 or $50? Not because of a change in supply or demand, but because all prices were going up. That's inflation. There are a lot of different causes of inflation, but one of the most important is too much money. The Fed can adjust the money supply by injecting money into the system electronically or by withdrawing money from the economy. Think of it. The Federal Reserve has the ability to create money and make it disappear. What's most important is what happens as a result. Anytime the supply of money is altered, the effects are felt throughout the economy. The Fed's methods have changed over time to take advantage of the latest computers and electronics, but its mission remains the same. To aim for stable prices, full employment, and a growing economy.
100 years ago, in 1913, the Fed was created, and we've marked it with a vertical line there. Consumer prices now are about 30 times higher than they were when the Fed was created in 1913. Paper money, too, is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve. Hence, the dollars in circulation are not treasury notes, not bills of credit, but Federal Reserve notes, debt-based notes backed up, ultimately, by the government's own promise to pay. It's sovereign bonds backed up by the taxpayers themselves. At one time, the Federal Reserve banks were legally required to keep large stockpiles of gold in reserve to back up these notes. But that requirement was abandoned, and today the notes are backed up mostly by government securities. The Fed no longer keeps any actual gold on its books, but gold certificates issued by the Treasury and valued not at the spot price of $1,300 per troy ounce, but an arbitrarily fixed statutory price of 42 and 2 ninths dollars per ounce. But I do have one question. During the crisis or any time that you're aware of, uh, has the Federal Reserve or Treasury participated in any gold swaps arrangements? Uh, we don't. The Federal Reserve does not own any gold at all. We have not owned gold since 1934. Um, so we have not engaged in any gold swaps. But it appears on your balance sheet that you hold gold. What appears on our balance sheet is gold certificates. When we turned in, in uh, before 1934, we did, the Federal Reserve did own gold. We turned that over by, um, by law to the Treasury and received in uh, return for that gold certificate. If, if the Treasury entered into, because under the Exchange Stabilization Fund, I would assume they probably have the, the legal authority to do it, they wouldn't be able to do it then because you have the securities for essentially all the gold? No, we have no the interest in the gold that uh, is owned by the Treasury. We have simply an accounting document that is called gold certificates that represents the value uh, at a statutory and, rate and, and still that we gave to the Treasury in 1930. And still measured at $42 an ounce, which makes no That's sense right. whatsoever. Clearly, there is a discrepancy between what we are led to believe is motivating the Fed and what it actually does. To understand what the Fed is actually intended to do, it's first important to understand that the Federal Reserve is not a bank, per se, but a system. This system codifies, institutionalizes, oversees, and undergirds a form of banking called fractional reserve banking, in which banks are allowed to lend out more money than they actually have in their vaults. Well, the whole process starts, the process of decay and corruption starts with something called fractional reserve banking. That's the technical name for it. And what that really means is that uh, as the banking institution developed over several centuries, starting of course in Europe, um, it, it developed the practice of um, legalizing a certain dishonest accounting procedure. In other words, in the very, very beginning, if you want to go all the way back, people would bring their gold or silver to the banks for safekeeping. And they say, give us a paper receipt, and we don't want to guard our silver and our gold because, you know, people could come in in the middle of the night and they could kill us or, or tie us up and and uh, threaten us and they'll get our gold and silver so we can't really guard it. We'll take it to the bank and have them guard it and we just want a paper receipt so that we can take the receipt back and get our gold anytime we want. And uh, so in the beginning, you know, money was receipt money. They could then, instead of changing or exchanging the gold coins, they could exchange the receipts and people would expect uh, ex uh, accept the receipts just as well as the gold, knowing they could get the gold. And so these paper receipts being circulated were, in essence, the very first examples of paper money. Well, the banks d learned early on that game that here they were sitting on this pile of gold and all these paper receipts out there, people weren't bringing the receipts in anymore. Very few of them, maybe maybe 5%, maybe 7% of the people would bring in their paper receipts and ask for the gold. So they said, aha, uh -huh, why don't we just sort of give more receipts out than we have gold? They'll never know because well, they never, we only are asked at the best, 7% of it so we can we can create more receipts for gold than we have and and we can collect interest on that because we'll loan that into the economy and we'll charge interest on this money that we don't really have 
And it's a pretty good gimmick, don't you think? And they, well, yeah, of course. And so that's how fractional reserve banking started. And now it's institutionalized and they teach it in school. They never, no one ever questions the uh, integrity of it or the ethics of it. They say, well, that's the way banking works. And isn't it wonderful that we now have this flexible currency and we have prosperity and all of this sort of thing. So it all starts with this concept of fractional reserve banking. And the trouble is with that is it works most of the time, but every once in a while, these there are a few ripples that come along that are a little bit bigger than the other ripples. And maybe one of them is a wave and more than 7% will come in and ask for their gold. Maybe 20% will come in or 30%. And well, now the banks are embarrassed because the, the fraud is exposed. They said, well, we don't, we don't have your gold. What do you mean you don't have my gold? Uh, I gave it to you and put it on deposit and you said you'd safeguard it. Well, we don't have it. We loaned it out. <laughs> so then the word gets out and everybody and their uncle comes and lines up for their gold. And, and of course, they don't have it. And the banks are closed. They have bank holidays and people, the banks are embarrassed. They go out of business. People lose their savings. And you have these, these terrible banking crashes that were ricocheting all around the world prior to this time. And that is what, that's what caused the concern. One of the things that caused the concern of the American people, they didn't want that anymore. They wanted to put a stop to that. And that was the whole purpose, supposedly, of the Federal Reserve System, is to put a stop to that. But since the people who designed the plan to put a stop to it were the very ones who were doing it in the first place, you can not be surprised that their solution was not a very good one insofar as the American people were concerned. Their solution was to expand it. Not to control it, but to expand it. See, prior to that time, this little game of fractional reserve banking was localized at the state level. Each state was doing its own little fractional reserve banking system. Each state, in essence, had its own federal reserve. Central banks were authorized by state law to do this sort of thing. And that was causing all this problem. And so the federal reserve came along and said, well, no, no, we're not going to do this at the state level anymore because look at all the problem it's causing. We're going to consolidate it all together and we're going to do it at the national level. The key to this system, of course, is who controls this incredible power to regulate the economy by setting reserve requirements and targeting interest rates? The answer to this question, too, has been deliberately obscured. The Federal Reserve System is a deliberately confusing mishmash of public and private interests, reserve banks, boards and committees, centralized in Washington, and spread out across the United States. Uh, so you have the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, uh, appointed by the president. That's the only part um, of this system that is uh, directly dependent upon the government for input. That's the federal part that the government, the president specifically, gets to choose a few select governors. The 12 regional banks, uh, the most influential of which is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, essentially based in Wall Street to represent Wall Street, um, is a, a representative of uh, the major Wall Street banks who own shares in the private, not federal, but private Federal Reserve Bank of New York. All the other regional banks are also private banks. Uh, they vary according to how much influence they wield, um, but the Kansas City Fed is uh, influential, the St. Louis Fed, the Dallas Fed, but the uh, uh, the New York Fed is um, the, really the center of this system and precisely because it represents the Wall Street banks who appoint um, the leadership of the New York Fed. So the New York Fed has a lot of public power um, but no public accountability. It has no oversight. Um, it does not answer to Congress the way that the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors does. And even then the chairman of the Fed, of the Federal Reserve Board, who is appointed by the president, does not answer to the president. He does not answer to Congress. He goes to Congress to testify, but the policy that they set is independent. So they, they have no input from the government. The government can't tell them what to do, legally speaking. And, of course, they don't. Do you think it would cause pr uh, problems for the Fed or for the economy if, if that uh, legislation was to pass? My concern about the legislation is that if the G GAO 
is auditing not only the operational aspects of our programs and the details of the programs, but is making judgments about our policy decisions that would effectively be a takeover of monetary policy by the Congress, a, re a repudiation of the independence of the Federal Reserve, which would be highly destructive to the stability of the financial system, the dollar, and uh, our national economic situation. Uh, the Federal Open Market Committee is responsible uh, for setting interest rates. Now, this committee, which is enormously powerful, has uh, as its membership the uh, governor and vice chair of the uh, Federal Reserve Board. But the Federal Open Market Committee, most of the membership is the uh, presidents of the regional Federal Reserve banks representing private interests. So they, they have significant input into setting the interest rates. Interest rates are not set by a public body. They're set by private financial and corporate interests. Uh, and that's whose interests they serve, of course. The reason that the Federal Reserve goes to such great lengths to make its organizational structure as confusing as possible is to cover up the massive conflicts of interest that are at the heart of the system. The fact is that the Federal Reserve System is comprised of a board of governors, 12 regional banks, and an open market committee. The privately owned member banks of each Federal Reserve Bank vote on the majority of the Reserve Bank's directors, and the directors vote on members to serve on the Federal Open Market Committee, which determines monetary policy. What's more, Wall Street is given a prime seat at the table, with tradition holding that the president of the powerful New York Federal Reserve Bank be given the vice chairmanship of the FOMC and be made a permanent committee member. In effect, the private banks are the key determinants in the composition of the FOMC, which regulates the entire economy. According to the Fed, its monetary policy decisions do not have to be approved by the president or anyone else in the executive or legislative branches of government, it does not receive funding appropriated by the Congress, and the terms of the members of the Board of Governors span multiple presidential and congressional terms. Or, in the words of Alan Greenspan, what is the uh, proper relationship, what should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. The Fed goes on in its self-mythologization to state that it is not a private, profit-making institution. This characterization is dishonest at best, and an outright lie at worst. The regional banks are themselves private corporations, as noted in a 1928 Supreme Court ruling. Instrumentalities like the national banks or the Federal Reserve banks, in which there are private interests, are not departments of the government. They are private corporations in which the government has an interest. This point is even admitted by the Federal Reserve's own senior counsel. We are, our regulations do specify overall terms for the, the lending, but the day-to-day -day operation of the banking activities are conducted by the Federal Reserve banks. They are banks, and indeed they do lend. And they so do they're, they're their, their own deposits. agency then, essentially, they are in not that agencies. regard. Yes, they're not agencies, Your Honor. They're persons under FOIA. Each Federal Reserve bank, uh, the stock is owned by the member banks in the district, 100% uh, privately in health. They have private boards of directors. Majority of those boards are appointed by the independent banks, private banks in the district. They are not agencies. These private corporations issue shares that are held by the member banks that make up the system, making the banks the ultimate owners of the Federal Reserve Banks. Although the Fed's profits are returned to the Treasury each year, the member bank's shares of the Fed do earn them a 6% dividend. According to the Fed, the fixed nature of these returns means that they are not being held for profit. Despite the dishonest nature of this description, however, it is important to understand that the bankers who own the Federal Reserve indeed do not make their money from the Fed directly. Instead, the benefits are much less obvious and much more insidious. The simplest way that this can be understood is that, as a century of history and the specific example of the last financial crisis shows, the Fed was used as a vehicle to bail out the very bankers who own the Fed banks in the most obvious example of fascistic collusion imaginable. Uh, a handful of financial institutions have enriched themselves as a result of institutional speculation on a large scale, uh, as well as manipulation of the market, 
And secondly, what they have done is that they have then uh, gone to the to their governments and said, well, we are now in a very difficult situation and you need to lend us, you need to give us money so that we can retain uh, the, the stability of the financial system. And who actually lends the money or brokers the public debt? The same financial institutions which are the recipients of the, of the bailout, okay? And so what you have is a circular process. It's a, it, it's a diabolical process. You're lending money. You're not, you're not lending money. You're handing money to the, to the large financial institutions. And, um, and then uh, this is leading up to mounting um, public debt in the trillions. Okay? And then you say to the, to, the, to the financial institutions, we need to establish a new set of, of uh, treasury bills and, and government bonds, etc., uh, which of course are sold to the public, but they are always brokered through the financial institutions, which uh, establish their, their viability and so on and so forth. And the financial institutions will, will, uh, will probably buy part of this public debt. Uh, so that in effect what the government is doing is financing its own indebtedness through the bailouts. It, it, it hands money to the banks, but to, ha to hand the money to the, to the banks, it becomes indebted to those fa same financial institutions. And then it says, well, we now have to emit large amounts of public debt. Uh, please, can you help us? Uh, and then the banks will say, well, you, your, your books are not quite in order. And then the government will say, well, obviously they're not in order because we've just we've just handed you 1.4 trillion dollars of of bailout money and we're now in a in a very difficult situation so we need to borrow money from from the people who are in fact the recipients of the bailout so this is really what we're dealing with we're dealing with a circular process the 2008 crisis and subsequent bailouts are merely the latest and most brazen examples of the fundamental conflicts of interest at the heart of America's privately owned central banking system. Beginning with the collapse of Lehman Brothers in September of that year, the Federal Reserve embarked on an unprecedented program of bailouts and special zero-interest lending facilities for the very banks that had caused the subprime meltdown in the first place. By the cartelization of the Federal Reserve structure, and thus not by accident, it was the very bank presidents who had overseen their bank's lending practices that ended up in the director positions of the Federal Reserve banks that voted on where to direct the trillions of dollars in bailout money. And unsurprisingly, they directed it toward their own banks. A stunning 2011 Government Accountability Office report examined $16 trillion of bailout facilities extended by the Fed in the wake of the crisis and exposed numerous examples of blatant conflicts of interest. Jeffrey Immelt, chief executive of General Electric, served as a director on the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York at the same time the Fed provided $16 billion in financing to General Electric. J.P. Morgan Chase chief executive Jamie Dimon, meanwhile, was also a member of the board of the New York Fed during the period that saw $391 billion in Fed emergency lending directed to his own bank. In all, Federal Reserve Board members were tied to $4 trillion in loans to their own banks. These funds were not simply used to keep these banks afloat, but actually to return these Fed-connected banks to a period of record profits in the same period that the average worker saw their real wages actually decrease and the economy on Main Street slow to a standstill. Ben Bernanke, at that time the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, was confronted about these conflicts of interest by Senator Bernie Sanders upon the release of the GAO report in June 2012. Senator, you raised an important point, which is that uh, this is not something the Federal Reserve created. This is, right. this is in the statute. This yes. Congress in the Federal Reserve Act said this is the governance of the Federal Reserve, and more specifically that bankers would be on the board. And Six out of nine. Sorry? Six out of nine in the regional banks are come from the banking industry. That's correct. That, and that is in the law. And right. I'll answer your question, though. My, my, the answer to your question is that Congress set this up. We have tried, I think we've made it to something useful and valuable. We do get information from it. But if, if Congress wants to change it, you know, of course, we will work with you to, to find uh, alternatives. 
Bernanke is completely right. These conflicts are, in fact, a part of the institution itself. A structural feature of the Federal Reserve that was baked into the Federal Reserve Act itself over 100 years ago by the bankers who conspired to cartelize the nation's money supply. You could not ask for a more succinct reason why the Federal Reserve itself, this admitted cartel of banking interests, needs to be abolished. But you could get one. We now know that for centuries, the people of the United States have been at war with the international banking oligarchs. That war was lost, seemingly for good, in 1913, with the creation of the Federal Reserve. With the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, President Woodrow Wilson could sign the American population to a century in which the money supply itself has depended on the whims of the banking cabal. A century of booms and busts, bubbles and depressions, has led to a wholesale redistribution of wealth toward those at the very top of the system. At the bottom, the masses toil in relative poverty, single-income households becoming double-income households out of necessity, their quality of life being slowly eroded as the Federal Reserve notes that pass for dollars are themselves devalued. Worse yet, the fraud itself perpetuates Alexander Hamilton's persistent myth that a national debt is necessary at all. The U.S. is now locked into a system whereby the government issues bonds to generate the funds for their operations, bonds that are backed up by the taxation of the public's own labor. The perpetrators of this fraud, meanwhile, remain in the shadows, largely ignored by a general public that could instantly recognize the latest Hollywood heartthrob or pop idol, but have no clue what the head of Goldman Sachs or the New York Fed does, let alone who they are. This cabal bear allegiance to no nationality, no philosophy or creed, no code of ethics. They are not even motivated by greed, but power. The power that the control of the money supply inevitably brings with it. After a person has all the money in the world that you could possibly use to buy anything you want, what's left to capture your imagination? And the answer, of course, is power. Power over people. Now, money is power over people, but there's another power over people as well, and that is the, the political power, the social power. And I think this has now become the dominant driving force of these people. They've already got the money. They've got it locked down. Now they're striving for this new world order, as, as their name for it. They want all of the world and into one political unit, which they dominate not only with money, but with military and psychological means and education and media and propaganda, they want total control over every human on the planet. And by golly, they're moving pretty rapidly in that direction. It did not take long for this lust for power to rear its head. In 1921, just seven years after the Fed began operations, the same J.P. Morgan-connected banking elite that founded the Federal Reserve incorporated an organization called the Council on Foreign Relations with the goal of taking over the foreign policy apparatus of the United States, including the State Department. In this quest, it was remarkably successful. Although there are only about 4,000 members in the organization today, its membership has included 21 secretaries of defense, 18 treasury secretaries, 18 secretaries of state, 16 CIA directors, and many other high-ranking government officials, military officers, business elite, and, of course, bankers. The first director of the CFR was John W. Davis, J.P. Morgan's personal lawyer and a millionaire in his own right. Together with its sister organizations in Britain and elsewhere around the world, these groups would work together toward what they called a new world order of total financial and political control directed by the bankers themselves. As Carol Quigley, noted Georgetown historian and mentor of Bill Clinton, wrote in his 1966 work, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time. The powers of financial capitalism had a far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert 
by secret agreements arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. The apex of the system was to be the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. This is why the bankers and their partners in government and business conspired to bring about the 2008 crisis. Not for the pursuit of money, but power. In the same way the bankers used the Panic of 1907 to consolidate their control over the money supply, they hoped to use the 2008 crisis and subsequent panics, which they themselves have created, to consolidate their political control. The International Summit for the Global Financial Crisis has been expanded from G7 to G20 because the leading seven developed countries cannot solve the crisis alone. This expanded meeting raises the question whether a new global financial system will be created. So is this some sort of a new world order, which, which Gordon oh, Brown kind of alluded to? British Prime Minister Gordon Brown has described the quote-unquote guiding principles to be addressed at the summit. They are transparency, sound banking, responsibility, integrity, and get this, global governance, unquote. I think a new world order is emerging, and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. The inevitable conclusion, one that flows necessarily from the true understanding of this situation, is that the Federal Reserve System needs to be consigned to the dustbin of history. After a century of enslavement, it is time for the American public to finally throw off the bankers' debt chains. If there is ever a point in human history to start questioning um, alternatives, uh, this would be it. And to think that where we are and simply say, oh, well, this is the best of our options. Um, how many of the best options lead to self-destruction? Doesn't sound like a best option. Uh, I think that with a world of 7 billion people, uh, we can probably come up with something better than a system in which a few thousand people um, benefit uh, so much at the expense of everything else uh, on this world and at the expense of the potential for the future of mankind. They're leveraging um, our future and so long as we accept this way of thinking, so long as we accept these institutions as having dominance, um, that's the direction we'll be going. So I think reform is a good way to try and stall um, and to push back uh, directly against the um, expanding and evolving power structures. Uh, but a radical change is what's really needed, and that has to be built from the bottom up. But I think that these two processes can and should um, uh, go together in parallel. If you've made it this far, congratulations. You are now better informed on the economic history of the United States and the truth about the Federal Reserve than 99% of the population. If you do nothing else, then just working to get those around you educated on this information alone will have a profound effect. Once they learn of the scam, many are motivated to do something about it, and they, in turn, inform others. This is the viral nature of suppressed truth, and it is the reason that more people are aware of and energized by the issue of the Federal Reserve and the nature of money than ever before. Perhaps even more amazingly, this movement is spreading to other parts of the globe. Recognizing the interlocking nature of the modern global economy and the international nature of the banking oligarchy, movements to abolish the Federal Reserve have sprung up in Europe, where protests against the cartelized central banking system are taking place in over 100 cities, attracting 20,000 people on a weekly basis. I started this movement because I realized that uh, the Federal Reserve Act, in my opinion, is one of the most worst um, laws in the whole world. So a private banking company is lending America the money, and in my opinion, America is not any more democratic. The Federal Reserve tells the government what to do, and that's a problem. It's a very big problem, especially in the U.S. Why is it a global issue and why are people doing it here in Germany? Because when you realize that this finance system, it's a global system, you have to go to the 
really beginning of the system. And in my opinion, it's also the World Bank and the International Fund of Currencies and stuff like this. But at the beginning of all this is a law from 1913, Woodrow Wilson signed it. And this is the beginning of all this hardcore capitalism we are suffering right now from. And the only way to stop this is maybe to break this law. But what if the burgeoning movement to end the Fed is successful? What system do people propose as the answer? There have been several proposals along different lines by various researchers. Some argue for a return to America's colonial roots of debt-free money issued by state-run banks, pointing to the Bank of North Dakota as one already functioning, successful model of this approach. We've had two, two banking systems ever since the 1860s, the, the state bank system and the federal bank system and the federal bank system are the big wall street banks particularly they dominate the federal system so they're taking over right now i mean in california i don't we don't even have any local banks where i am they're they're now uh, we had two and i had accounts in both of them and they're now one of them is chase bank and the other is u.s bank so they're both big wall street banks now they've been taken over so if you can keep it's the local banks that have an interest in serving the local business. The big banks have no interest in making loans to local business. It's too risky. Why should they bother? They've got this virtually free money they can get from the Fed and from each other. And it's much more lucrative to them either to speculate in commodities or other things abroad, or what's what works very well for them is to buy long-term government bonds at 3% because these have no capital requirement. The capital requirement for government bonds are zero. So they can buy all of those that they want. Whereas if they if they buy, let's say, mortgages, or if they make, I mean, if they make loans for mortgages or they make loans to, to businesses, then they have to worry about their capital requirement. And as soon as they've um, used up all their capital, in other words, you know, $8 of capital will get you $100 of loans, then they can't make any more loans. They have to wait for 30 years till those loans get paid off. So what they do if they do buy mortgages is um, sell them off to, to investors. And so that, that was the whole mortgage-backed security scam that, that we've seen. Uh, I mean, they had no motivation to make sure that these uh, borrowers were actually sound borrowers. They just wanted to make a, a sale, so they sold the stuff to the unwary investors who might be somebody in Iceland or Sweden or you know, um, or pension funds. And yeah, so so that didn't work out so well. So so a state bank with the uh, partnering with the local banks can provide the capital, can help them with capital. The in North Dakota, the state bank guarantees the loans of the local banks, allowing them to make much bigger loans than they could otherwise. And they provide the state bank provides liquidity to the small banks. That's why the small banks, uh, the local banks aren't making loans to small business right now because they don't they aren't they don't know that they can get money from the other banks as needed. The way banking works is they make the loan first. I mean, if you have credit lines to a many different businesses, and if they all hit up their credit lines at once, you're going to run out of money. Uh, so you don't dare do that unless you know that you can get short-term loans from the other banks. And what's happening right now, even though there's $1.6 trillion in excess reserves sitting on the books of the big, big banks, they're not available to the little banks. And the reason is because the Fed is paying... 0.25% interest on those reserves. So the banks have no no incentive to lend them to the little banks. Why let go of them when you can make just as much keeping them and then you still have your reserves and you can use them as collateral to buy bonds or something that'll, that'll make you more money. So the whole system is messed up. Um, and in North Dakota, this, the Bank of North Dakota provides the liquidity for these local banks. Others advocate a decentralized system of alternative and competing currencies that greatly reduce or even eliminate altogether the need for a central bank. Well, 22 years ago in Ithaca, New York, I noticed that a lot of people, friends particularly, had skills and time that were not being employed or respected by the prevailing economy. And uh, while we had uh, 
much desire to create things and trade them with each other and many services we could provide to each other. We didn't have the money. So, since I have a background in graphic design, journalism, and uh, arrogance, I went to my computer and designed paper money for Ithaca, New York. I uh, designed pretty colorful money you know, with pictures of children, waterfalls, and trolley cars and denominated in hours of labor. One hour note, half hour, quarter, eighth hour note, two hour note. And uh, then uh, began to issue to each of the pioneer traders who had agreed to be listed in the directory a specific starter amount. And the game began. An hour was worth, uh, has been worth an hour of basic labor or 10 U.S. dollars, which at that time 20 years ago was double the minimum wage. People who usually expect more than $10 per hour of their service can charge multiple hours per hour, but the denomination puts between us as residents of our community that reminder that we are fellow citizens, not merely winners or losers scrambling for dollars. And uh, it, it introduces us to each other on the basis of the skills and services that we have that we are more proud to provide for each other than often is the case with a conventional job, just the stuff we have to do to get the money to pay the bills. So through that trading process, that more intimate scale process on, within the community, we're more easily able to become friends and lovers and political allies. It's an inspiring story, and and uh, tell people about the, the how much how much money has circulated through this community. I mean, it's important for people to understand just how successful this has been. Because we are not a computer system, we don't have a specific volume of trading recorded. But by the grapevine, by phone surveys, and over the years watching the money move, we were able to guess very reliably, several million dollars equivalent of this money has transacted over those years, making loans without charging interest up to $30,000 value, which is the fundamental monetary revolution in our system, then as well making grants of the money to over 100 community organizations. Some argue for currencies whose mathematical nature prevent them from being merely conjured into existence whenever a federal government wants to wage another war of aggression or forge another link in the seemingly endless train of governmental tyranny and abuse. What people have to understand about Bitcoin is that it's a completely decentralized network. There's no central server, there's no controlling company, there's no office. It's just free software that anyone can download and start running on their computer anywhere in the world and that the Bitcoins themselves can be transferred to or from anyone anywhere in the world. And it's impossible for any bank or government or entity to block you from sending or receiving those Bitcoins. There's a limited supply of those Bitcoins. There will never, ever, ever be more than 21 million Bitcoins. And so be because, like everything, the price is set based on supply and demand, because the supply of Bitcoins is limited and the demand is increasing as more and more people start to use them and more and more websites start to accept them, the price of Bitcoins in terms of dollars is going to have to increase even a lot more than the $500 uh, per Bitcoin that it is today. Are there any drawbacks at all to the idea of using a cryptocurrency? Uh, if you're part of the, the current power elite that can just print money at will to spend on whatever you feel like, then yeah. Uh, the world switching over to Bitcoin is probably not going to benefit you, but if you're one of the normal people that uh, aren't working for you know, the Federal Reserve or any central bank that's printing money to, to pay to your friends and that sort of thing, then uh, a Bitcoin world is a wonderful thing for you. Sound money, cryptocurrencies, state banks, let's programs, self-issued credit, these and many other solutions have all been proposed, and many of them are in use in different localities today. Information on all of these ideas, and how they are being applied in various parts of the world, are widely available online. The point is that the question of what money is, and how it should be created, is perhaps the single greatest question facing humanity as a whole, and yet it is one that has been almost completely eliminated from the national conversation. Until recently.
Sometimes other do. It's not even real paper. What the hell? We need some hands up. Hands up. Hands up. Hands up. Hands up. I haven't even gotten to that part yet. We can do it again when I get to that part. And so the rest of the story is now in our hands. Once we understand the scam that has taken place, the gradual consolidation of wealth and power in the hands of an elite few banking oligarchs, and the growing impoverishment of the masses, all in the name of banking funny money created out of nothing and loaned to the public at interest, we can choose to get active, or to do nothing at all. For those who choose to get active, there are some steps that you can take to help change the course of the system. First. Follow the links and resources from the transcript of this documentary at corbettreport.com slash Federal Reserve to familiarize yourself with the history, the connections, and the functions of the Federal Reserve System. If you can't explain this material to yourself, then you will never be able to teach it to others. Secondly, begin reaching out to others to bring them up to speed on the issue. It can be as simple as broaching this conversation in the Monday morning water cooler talk, or passing out a copy of this documentary, or sending out links to this information to your email list. Insert this topic into your conversations. When people start talking about the national debt, or the state of the economy, or other political talking points, get them to question the roots of these issues, and why there is a national debt at all. Thirdly, when you are able to find or create a group of like-minded people in your area who are engaged with the issue, Start a study group on the issue and its solutions. The study group can help source alternative or complementary currencies in the local area, or, if none exist already, the group can form the basis for a community of local businesses and customers who are willing to start experimenting with ways to wean themselves off of the Federal Reserve notes. Fourthly, use the resources at CorbettReport.com, including the Federal Reserve Information Flyer, or hold DVD screenings to attract interest in your group and draw others into studying the true nature of the monetary system. The work of building up an alternative to the current system can seem daunting, even at times overwhelming. But it is important to keep in mind that the Federal Reserve system that seems so monolithic today has only been around for one century. Central banks have been defeated in America before, and they can be defeated again. The question of how we decide to change this system is not rhetorical. It will either be answered by an informed, engaged, active population working together to create viable alternatives and to dismantle the current system, or it will be answered by the same banking oligarchy that has been controlling the money supply, and indeed the lifeblood of the country, for generations. Now, one century after the creation of the Federal Reserve System, we have a choice to make. Whether the next century, like the one before it, will be a century of enslavement, or, transformed by the actions and choices that we make in the light of this knowledge, a century of empowerment. Hello, this is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, the writer, producer, director, narrator, and just about everything else you can imagine with regards to the documentary that you just finished watching, Century of Enslavement, The History of the Federal Reserve. As I mentioned towards the end of that documentary, if you've made it this far, then you are now better informed about the Federal Reserve, its origins, what it is, how it functions, and why it must be opposed 
than 99% of the general public. And if you've made it this far, then you are obviously one of the very few who is very eager and motivated to join the rising tide of free humanity that is seeking to throw off the debt chains of the banksters in the United States and around the world. And if you are so motivated, then I have some treats for you. I have some resources that I'd like to direct you to. As I mentioned again, towards the end of that documentary, there are some resources up at CorbettReport.com that I hope will help you in your quest to better inform yourself and better inform others about the Federal Reserve System. Because once again, if you can't explain this to yourself, then how could you ever hope to explain it to anyone else? So I think the first quest that we must all engage in is to improve our own understanding of the Federal Reserve System and how it functions, and then to spread that information to others. And on that note, once again, if you go to CorbettReport.com, you'll be able to find first and foremost, this documentary itself is of course 100% freely available online, which you would know because you're watching this right now. So of course there will be links to the YouTube version of this documentary or the downloadable MP4 version on my website. There's also audio MP3 files available for download. All of those, again, freely open to the public, and I do encourage you to send them out to others if you do find it to be a valuable resource yourself. And uh, once you're there at CorbettReport.com, you'll find not only the documentary itself, but also a transcript of the documentary, complete with hyperlinks to all of the source documents, videos, articles, all of the information that was used to compile this documentary. So I hope that will be a valuable resource, again, for people who are looking to put this information together in a way that makes sense in their own head, and so that they can see where all of this information is coming from, much of it sourcing from the Federal Reserve itself. So I hope that the a hyperlinked transcript will be valuable to people out there who are seeking to broaden their understanding of these topics. And you will also find there uh, a news, uh, an information pamphlet that uh, I have put together with the help of Mike Krentz of MikeKrentz.com, a graphic designer who's helped me out a lot uh, behind the scenes on the website. As you can tell from the graphics on this documentary, I'm not a graphic designer myself uh, by trade or by training. So I certainly do help uh, appreciate Mike's help in putting this information pamphlet together and uh, this is just some of just a few points uh, that have been addressed in this video informational points about the Federal Reserve what it is and some interesting little teasers to get people interested in this information you can download and print this off from CorbettReport.com and use it however you like handing it out to people on the street uh, using it as a discussion point if you hold a DVD screening or um, uh, if you want to uh, just post it up in public areas, only where allowed by law, of course. Once again, this is uh, freely available for download and for you to print out and uh, to use to help spread information about the Federal Reserve System. And it's available both in color and black and white and should print nicely onto standard 8.5 by 11 letter size paper. So that will also all be up there at the website, along with, of course, an actual DVD version of this documentary. Once again, if you do find this information useful, then I hope you will try to spread it to others. There are a lot of people who prefer the online link, but there will be some people who you cannot reach online. For those people and for yourself, if you so desire, here is a physical hard copy that you can order from CorbettReport.com for 2,000 Japanese yen. That's about 20 Federal Reserve notes. Because unfortunately, we are trapped in this uh, debt-based bank bankster-led system. So we do r all require these pieces of paper in order to put a roof over our head and food on the table, myself included. So your support is obviously greatly appreciated. And for that 2,000 Japanese yen, about 20 Federal Reserve notes, you'll receive this documentary. Uh, disc 1 containing the documentary itself. Disc 2, the full one-hour interview with G. Edward Griffin. So uh, I think, of again, a valuable resource for people who are looking for more information about the Federal Reserve. So that's available at CorbettReport.com along with all of this that we've talked about here, the information pamphlet, the hyperlink transcript, all of the, the various formats this is available in. Once again, I've tried to make this as, as straightforward as possible and, um, a, a, and also as detailed as possible so that you can start to further your own exploration and understanding of this system that we're facing. Once again, 
Of course, any way that you choose to get this information out to others is greatly appreciated, but if you do want to send the Corbett Report links around, the best one to use is corbettreport.com slash Federal Reserve. That will have the documentary in the YouTube format, it will have the downloadable MP3 and MP4 formats, it will have the transcript, uh, it will have the, the downloadable information pamphlet, and it will also have a link to buy the DVD. So all of that will be there at corbettreport.com slash Federal Reserve. Please send people there if you're going to send people anywhere. So once again, I really do salute you for taking time out of your busy day, out of your schedule, to devote yourself to watching and learning and understanding this material and to helping spread this information and awareness to others because it is only together that we will ever be able to form the movement that will ultimately turn the tide against the banksters and defeat the Federal Reserve and all of the similarly privately controlled central banks all around the world. So once again, thank you for your time and attention. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com.